So obviously it's big. It's a 10 inch. So yeah, I'm, I'm very proud of my latest work. We are here with the one and only Andrew Jones. I know the last time we spoke, Andrew was in Chicago. Yeah. And we mentioned these. Well, now they're a reality. So I'm going to step they out are, of here. Finally. And, yeah. I'm going to step out of here and let you talk <laughs> about them. This is the Source Point 10. So it's a play on words because it's a concentric driver and kind of point source. But it's also a recognition of going back to the source to get as close as we can to the sound that was recorded, source point. And Sorry. 10 refers to the size of the driver. 10 inch woofer, but it's a woofer slash mid-range. And this is a first for me doing that. I've worked with 10 inch woofers before. Yeah. Because I did the TAD reference mm -hmm. one. That was twin 10 inch long throw woofers, but as woofers. This is the first time I've actually done a 10 inch woofer mid-range. I have to say, when I started this, I was very curious as to how it would work out. I've done all this work to optimise the cone profile and match it to the tweeter, design this multi-roll surround that's very shallow profile so it doesn't disrupt the sound from the tweeter, blended it into the baffle. But what do you do about diffraction from the edges of the cabinet? And so you can choose either to put it in a baffle that gently curves backwards away from the edge of the driver, or you can do a kind of piecemeal approximation to that and put in these facets. So you've got a, a non-rectangular flat part of the baffle, and then you've got these different angle facets. So they're brake lines that spread the diffraction around and help smooth that out. Did you ever have any doubts that it was going to work out? Like you're going to have to go back to the drawing board? Potentially, yes. I'd never done a 10 inch concentric and I was curious about how that might work out. And the nice thing with having joined MoFi to develop these speakers is that I was given the chance to come up with concepts and try them out. And how long did it take from conception to reality? It's taken close to 18 months to 18 months. get it to the point and be in production. We actually received our shipment this week. So they're ready. They're so on they're ready. They're okay. on the way to our warehouse. The initial design brief was to have big, you know, big impactful base. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I always want to try and do a concentric driver. But they get very complex. Given that most of my concentrics have been 4-inch, 5-inch diameter, if you just increase cone size, you get a lot more output without requiring more excursion. So, I thought, okay, well that goes hand in hand with having a nice big woofer, so let's try it. Did you have a cost point in, in mind when you started designing these, or was it just something... <laughs> yes, and I missed it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, once... Once we started to see what this was developing into, we accepted that, okay, it's not where we thought necessarily we were going to go. And the retail price is coming in at? 36 pair. Per a pair. Yes. A pair, okay. But we decided let's keep going because this is our first chance to make technology-led speaker. Mm -hmm. And so don't waste the opportunity. It's, go it's drifting in this direction. Let's make sure we don't nobble it right mm -hmm. from the beginning. And so I kept going with it and refining it. Started to build the prototypes and I did all this work, but I haven't actually heard it. I've done measurements, but I haven't heard it. And it was a very exciting moment. The day I'd first you know, worked out a crossover network, um, made all the measurements, verified that the crossover was working, and then sat down and listened to it. Was it, how close was it to what we have today? Uh, pretty close. There's only been little tweaks since that first version. Um, some of it driven by uh, some improvements in the measurements I was making. Some just from listening. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I've, I've said it over and over again. You do measurements. And if you think about the frequency response of an amplifier, for example. Yeah, it's flat. 
you're never going to get flat, not in a typical passive speaker. You're going to get something that's wiggling around flat. And in some areas, it'll be up, other areas down. That all gives character. And you know, I've got a chart from 1934 from GEC that plots different frequency bands and says if this is up, then trumpets sound bright. If this is down, female voice sounds thin, and, and so on, back from 1934. Those factors are the ones that you're really concerned about, not just the overall trend of the frequency response, but those individual areas that you're fighting to control and improve, and which ones matter most, what impact do they have on the sound character, and you can only determine that by listening to some recordings. Which ones? We all know that there are some good recordings and some bad ones. And of the different good recordings, different recording engineers have a different idea of the sound presentation that they're trying to reach. So how do I make my decisions? It's me listening to it, referring back to my measurements, and you know perhaps I see an area that uh, in the frequency response needs improving, so I go out and improve it and go and listen to it and go, did that change what I thought I was hearing? Or was it something else that was responsible? And so you, you iterate around that loop as much as you can. But ultimately, I'm deciding which imperfections to fix and which to not worry about. So out of all the speakers you've created, they're all your kids. <laughs> Where does this one land as far as being one of your favorites not your favorite it, problem child it's, your favorite. it's getting to the top not the top of my list because i'd have to judge it against my tad speakers but it's quickly becoming a real favorite of mine when you're working at a 10 inch driver size you've got to very carefully consider cone materials because some materials if you decided to go exotic like when i was doing the beryllium drivers with TAD. You just can't do a 10 inch beryllium driver. The cost is prohibited, the manufacturing of it, no one solved yet. And for most of the time, if it's a pure base driver, you don't need that advanced cone material because you're never working it up that high. I, I looked around at different cone materials and you know, to some extent, what I found was governed by the fact that they weren't trying to make a base mid-range. But even so, the breakup modes were too strong and too low for any of the exotic materials within the price range that I was looking to do. Look around and thinking, well, they do it all the time in PA drive units. Why don't I look at a few PA drive units and see what the promise is? How good or bad can they be? And I started to see that some of the paper cones are actually very good. Okay. So I've chosen the pulp mix. I've, cho I've um, tooled up a new cone profile, tooled up for a new surround, tooled an entirely new magnet assembly on them. So it's all fully custom designed and manufactured. Um, there's just nothing in there that's off the shelf. So this is the fun speaker. It, it's both got the clarity and the hear through for getting into the music and hearing all the details and uh, hearing the emotion of it. But when you want to step it up, uh, you don't have to be afraid and you can just turn up the volume. So yeah, I'm, I'm very proud of my latest work. What's next? <laughs> What's next? Um, we'll be following with... Um, are you gonna take a break or are you already working no, on something new? No, I'm already working on something new to add to this, so. Step up, step down, or can you say? Uh, both. both. <laughs> Good. Yeah. All right, so these come in pairs, but if someone wants to run them um, as a front, center, and right, you can sell them individually, right? Yes, they, they because of the weight, they're 46 pounds each, so we weren't going to pair pack them. So the individual packs, which makes it very easy to kind of split and uh, buy a single one for center channel use. Uh, we've designed a, st a stand. So the thing about a concentric driver is that 
it can go on its side and not change its performance. You know, its, it's off-axis response is consistent in every direction. But because the cabinet slightly curves or well, bends inwards towards the back, uh, if you put it on its side, it tilts itself up at about a three degree angle. So it, you can have a lower stand if you need. But then we've designed a block that goes on top of the stand or on top of a cabinet, if you're going to place it on a cabinet, that incorporates the angle to match the cabinet. So you just put that on the stand, put the speaker on its side, on top of here, and now it's fully stable on its side. So perfect for center channel or for use as a, on a mixing desk, on a console. So that's a, an additional option that will be available. Well, very good, man. I appreciate your time today, Andrew. It's great seeing you. And it's great to see these uh, mystery speakers now a reality. <laughs> yes. I mean, I mean, this is it's fantastic now that I, I finally get to show them off. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to have fun this weekend. <laughs>